I want to talk to you today about something very, 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 very exciting. And this is about rethinking the Old Kingdom because I want to present the Old Kingdom to you in a new kind of way that people haven't really thought about before, at least in a public sphere. Uh, I want to present you with some archaeological evidence for it. So first of all, let's set the stage. We are talking more or less about the period from around 2700 to about 2200 BC right now. And the Old Kingdom is often described as, as kind of the state building age. It's the pyramidal age, right? It's the period in time where the Egyptians build the pyramids. It's the, they build all the great pyramid complexes, whether it's Khufu, whether it's Snufru, whether it's Djosa, whatever it is, right? But the Old Kingdom proper, generally in terms of time scales, it lasted from about 2700 BC to about 2300 or 2200 BC, that kind of time period. Uh, and it ends or culminates in what we call the First Intermediate Period. And that is a time period that usually is thought to have signaled the collapse of the Old Kingdom power structures and the Old Kingdom uh, administration because they have kind of a planning system where, it's, where they have planned, city, uh, planned cities, planned cemeteries, all these kinds of things. And towards the end of the Old Kingdom, uh, power moves away from centralized kingship or the centralized pharaonic state, and it moves more into local governors, which are known as nomarchs, and we'll come back to those in a little bit. And the local nomarchs eventually get more and more powerful towards the end of the Old Kingdom, and it fractures the sort of poli uh, the political unity of Egypt in the first period or the first intermediate period, where there are a string of successions of sort of um, new developments uh, and the unity of, of the country is fragmented. And we have, rather than having one pharaoh or one king, we have a succession of a lot of different kings all at once, um, because you have kind of a situation where a lot of the local governors and local rulers are kind of vying for power and trying to sort of take power from other people. And we get some very interesting tombs. And then that eventually culminates in the Middle Kingdom, which we may come to uh, in, in another, another lecture, right? But generally speaking, when we think of the Old Kingdom, a lot of people generally think of things like increasing state formation, centralization, and the royal mortuary cult. But really more proper, it's the time to think of it as, you know, the, the, the reigns of Josa, Khufu, Sneferu, all these kind of old kingdom kings, and, and of course also uh, the, the sun temples to Ra, right? And, and Ra is one of, the, uh, one of the oldest and most important deities uh, from from the old kingdom right and it's a very kind of interesting idea uh the narrative that is often told in most of the schools of egyptology at least if you were coming into egyptology you know 10 years ago 20 years ago um is that the old kingdom as i said is a time of increasing state formation and centralization uh and the kingship with the royal mortuary cults and so on and so on but it's an idea of, of of surplus and supply that are needed to build those mortuary complexes. And while this kind of thing is definitely true, and uh, or at least for Egypt as a whole, what I want to talk about today is something a little bit different. I actually want to focus more on the people living in the provinces, the local sort of peasantry and farming Egyptians, the sort of the lay people more so than uh, the, the the royal cults, right, or the royal administration, so to speak. Because I want to ask a very basic question, and it's how much influence. Did the, did the Egyptian state have on its provinces and hinterlands? Because we have this assumption, usually in, in sort of early Egyptology, that kingship and state influence, it was a homogenous thing. And it kind of, it presents us, when you look at it in that way, seeing the Egyptian state from kind of a bird's eye view and thinking that it's all kind of unified and that everybody everywhere was building pyramids and everyone lived in very nice houses. Uh, it gives us a very distorted picture of the time period and what life was really like for the vast majority of the population. Because of the pyramids, the temples, the writing, everything that we currently focus on, even the tombs actually, everything that we currently focus on is kind of center specific. It's centered around the administration, it's centered around the royals and the kind of the higher elite members of the society, which is natural because they're the ones that preserve better. Uh, generally, the lower classes in the peasantry life in, in Egypt are quite ephemeral in, in the archaeological record. We don't have that much evidence of them. Um, but we like often to derive our arguments uh, primarily for the, from the existence of, of things like court cemeteries, elite tombs, monumental royal display, writing, inscriptions, that kind of thing. And all of these things are, are really, really good. They're, they're really good uh, archaeological 
options for, for investigation. They help our analysis of things like kingship, how the king is perceived, sort of the the, the more sort of official, quote unquote, religion. Uh, early writings are always very good, administration, all that kind of thing. But one of the things is increasingly obscure and has been obscure for a very long time is how the core of the pharaonic state actually was embedded in the territory that it claims to have administered so how much influence did the state really have outside of the palace walls certainly within the compounds of the administrations there were a lot of influence and, and the, the there is a uniformity across art styles and across monumentality and so on but outside of the capital regions outside of the memphite region or outside of Saqqara in the provincial areas of egypt how much influence did the administration of say joseph or snefru or any of the early old kingdom kings actually have right and it's a bit of an interesting question that's what i start oh i want to start answering today or sort of present some answers to you today right and that, that's my main question of how did the people outside of the main administration of Egypt, outside of Memphis especially, actually experienced the Egyptian state? What did it actually mean and feel like for, say, the average peasant or the average layperson living in the provinces in the south of Egypt rather than near them, like the capital in the north? Now, Bussman uh, put out, or Richard Bussman uh, put out a really amazing paper in 2015. I'm going to draw on a little bit here as well. And he argues there that the relationship between uh, state and the hinterland is the key for scaling the Egyptian state in the Old Kingdom, the relationship that the centralized pharaohs had with their hinterland and how much they could influence it is the key for us to understanding how the Egyptian state actually scaled in any kind of way. Because we certainly do have ideas of, of standardization, right? especially around, um, what should we say, around sort of Memphis, around, around the Saqqara kind of area. We definitely have instances of standardization and they are examples of social engineering and they have been observed since about the fourth or the third millennium bc in egypt right non-elite burial equipment becomes a lot simpler towards the end of the, uh, end of the pre dynastic and the turn towards the dynastic period uh, in the later latter half of the fourth millennium bc and of course things like hieroglyphs become much more standardized towards the beginning of the old kingdom uh we see things like here on the bottom which is the uh a giza cemetery that we have planned court cemeteries appearing out around the uh, around sort of the administration or the central administration uh, and we have things like pyramid towns in the mid uh, mid third millennium that show that the political core sort of the the immediate environment around the royal uh, residences definitely did try to shape their their social environment around them right according to what we can assume are specific or imagined models they had very sort of planned out grid structures they had ways they wanted things done but outside of those immediate environments outside of the memphite region for example or the royal the elite centers it's kind of interesting because we have a very clear lack of standardization in the provincial towns and it's kind of an interesting weird thing because in the early and middle old kingdom of egypt we have a, a lot of questions raised over the scale of the administration of the egyptian state because outside of those provincial outside of the capital regions rather the provincial regions display none of this kind of planned court they think they display none of this kind of evidence so clearly there is something going on where whatever they're doing in the capital regions and kind of the rich zones aren't quite reaching the the peasantry zones aren't reaching outside of that kind of area so it brings into question this idea of how unified the egyptian state actually was early on and when it did actually become unified now of course a lot of evidence is biased towards the center as we know right there are there is usually way too much focus on the capital cities like memphis for example which is the capital of the old kingdom although ironically even though memphis was the capital of the old kingdom the old kingdom layers of it still haven't actually been excavated because they are under layers of alluvial um depositions but there is too much focus on these capital cities ultimately that, that, that's what we're looking at here they are administrative hubs and because of that we really struggle to draw any kind of conclusions about how the rural hinterland of egypt actually was governed in any kind of way did they have local rulers were the nomarchs maybe a bit earlier we don't know right we don't know the extent to which kingship even played a role in these provincials uh, in these provincial towns right because in fact scholars like, like marina garcia have suggested that even in the late third millennium uh or the late third millennium administrative structures that we have they may date back to the first dynasty in theory, but they don't actually surface in the archaeological record until, you know, 
much much later they don't uh, in, in, at least until the uh, the later dynasties of the old kingdom because what ends up happening is from a, a kind of a bird's eye perspective so to speak uh we uh, if we look at kind of the small court community it seems like they kind of invented the state that's, that's kind of what it appears like right when we when we look at the initial administrative court and the royal residences in egypt especially as i said around the saqqara and all around the memphite regions generally speaking it seems as if they kind of invented the state once sort of the social conditions were allowed essentially um but what we're seeing more and more is that actually not much state really happened outside of the court so they tried to establish the court they tried to establish kind of a unified state or a unified monarchy with ideology religion uh, a shared culture all that kind of thing and while there is definitely shared culture that's that's a different story it really seems like it took a lot longer than most people think it did from the institution or the initial sparks of the the state ideology or the rise of the state it takes about another thousand years for the provincial towns and the rural towns to actually catch up and actually be implemented into that system now of course this isn't to say that there was no political unification in egypt because no doubt things like pyramid construction uh must have required increased exploitation of nature and workers and it would have required an excellent control of labor even just to take people off of farming uh or you know outside farming uh, adventures or ventures and put them onto paid rations for building the pyramids that requires a huge level of state organization so we're not denying that it existed but we are questioning the scale of it around the regions outside of the central areas so here's what i want to do okay i want to propose especially look at this picture we're going to come back to these two pictures a little bit later on i want to propose to you instead instead of thinking of old kingdom egypt as a unified thing that, it, that kind of universally exists. I want to propose to you that Old Kingdom Egypt is in fact a country of two different kinds of culture. There are two cultures in Old Kingdom Egypt. On the one side, which we can see on the left here, we have what we can call as the royal residence, right? The kind of the upper class, the elite version people of Egypt. These are the people of the royal administration and they are mainly based outside of the memphite area or the area surrounding memphis and saqqara or they're based living living out of memphis they're buried at the dead at saqqara uh and some other little provincial elite points throughout the country more or less right on the other side that we see here we're going to come back to these two images don't worry uh we see the culture of the working class the farming population for the most part the peasantry as, as we can call it and these people are attested mainly in the provinces but sometimes they appear in rural residences as, as you know not necessarily slaves but as uh, lower class citizens now these are the kind of the two cultures i want you to bear in mind on the one hand we have uh, the the royal residences or the royal administrators and on the other hand we have the provincial farmers the the rural egyptians the sort of the everyday lay people and i want you to really kind of start considering these almost as two different kinds of culture because they really have very little in common for the most part now of course early on in the old kingdom the administration attempts to divide the country into different districts especially ones called gnomes now, these gnomes really are, are quite key entities in the administrative language of egypt you can kind of think of them as states or counties today they are somewhat similar they're essentially administrative districts that the country is divided up into now they are obviously administrative but they also carry a very symbolic weight to them now they require to, to think about this in the right kind of way when you're thinking about the religious and cultic understanding of the gnomes you need to kind of think of it in the idiocentric uh, or idiosyncratic way that archaic states imagine themselves while economically and politically they serve the basic administrative district role they also have very clear cultic and religious roles so for example in in some later myths when the myth of osiris and seth come or the, the conflict of horus and seth rather comes about uh that story if you if you know your egyptian mythology the body parts of osiris are are cut up essentially by, by seth right he, there's the whole thing of uh, one day he sort of builds a sarcophagus uh and and it's built specifically for osiris osiris gets in he locks the door or set locks the door 
throws him into the Nile and then eventually cuts him up into, you know, different pieces, that kind of thing. Uh, but Osiris is dismembered that eventually when he's remembered together, he becomes king of the underworld and god of the netherworld, essentially. Uh, and he is also syncretized with the, the far, or he is seen rather as the father of the, the deceased king or the deceased father of the living king, I should say. Um, but where the gnomes come into it, especially later on, there were different variations of the story and how many different parts Osiris was cut up into. But when in, in from sort of the late Middle Kingdom onwards, we find this idea that uh, each of the body parts of Osiris were dispersed throughout the gnomes. And the gnomes kind of serve as the sum total representing Egypt, all the different places. And in fact, according from sources, from, according to sources from around, sort of, I think it's like the mid first millennium ish onwards, uh, each gnome and each district was said to have kept a relic of Osiris, so a part of his body that was associated with its own theology, its own deities, its own temples, all that kind of thing. So they were the homes of Osiris's parts, or, or sorry, the homes of different versions of Osiris potentially as well. So they have a very clear. Uh, religious context as well. Now, the oldest uh, complete list of gnomes that we know of at the moment is displayed on the walls of the White Chapel of Sestostris, uh, the first in, in the temple at Karnak around sort of the early 2nd millennium BC. Now, we do have a somewhat earlier list that is preserved more fragmentarily on the walls of the Valley Temple of King Snefru around circa 2500 BC, that kind of thing. But References to gnomes do date back to about the first dynasty. Almost all, all, all of them are in royal context, as you would imagine. Um, but the initial spark or the initial idea dates back to the first dynasty. But as we said, the extent to which that was actually implemented at all is questionable uh, until the late Old Kingdom. Because archaeologically, the idea of gnomes or the idea of separate districts is completely elusive prior to dynastic Egypt. Uh, the material culture of pre-dynastic period Egypt, it doesn't vary, as far as we can tell, along the lines of later gnome borders. So, so there, there was never kind of a case of saying, oh, well, I'm in this gnome, I have a specific kind of pottery or a specific kind of amulet. This guy over here on the other side of the border has a different one. In the pre-dynastic period, there is no variation. Uh, along along lines of gnome borders, and um, no, neither do any of the gnome symbols from later feature on pre-dynastic imagery like potteries or sedex or anything like that. Um, and this is a really interesting point because it kind of points to the idea that the association of gnome or gnomes are or the emergence of gnomes, I should say, are associated with the royal administration. And it kind of suggests that the idea was invented by the state and superimposed later, rather than the state looking to any kind of pre-dynastic precursors of the gnomes and building them out. Though, logically speaking, it's probably very likely that the gnomes originated as categorizations for larger trading villages or larger outposts with big temples or anything like that, right, earlier on, but there is no evidence for them in the pre-dynastic. The gnomes are very much a dynastic Egyptian invention. Uh, but as we move sort of through the third millennium BC and time sort of moves on, the focus or the center of the community, both in the provincial areas and also to some extent in, in the, the royal areas on, on the main things, on the main areas, it really shifts to the temple, right? And, and the temple is really kind of the economic, the religious and the cultic center of the Egyptian village, if you imagine. Um, it's and it really is kind of the inter I want you to kind of think of temples not in the sense of only serving religious function where it, it's not only where you go to worship the gods it's also the administrative center of your village it's kind of like your town hall almost it's not it's not just the cultic stuff it's also a dominant interface between the local and central administration it's where all the letters get sent to like your big post office essentially but all the it's where all the letters get sent to it's where all the officials kind of go and live um and it, it kind of takes care of all of all of all of the community and you even would have brought gifts and offerings to the temple anyway that would then be sent up the nile towards uh the the center of memphis essentially uh, and in fact an interesting point is that even in the late old kingdom this is reflected because the most of the times what the people who would later become nominal Marks, so the sort of the local governors of, of villages, they often began their career with the title overseer of priests. So the nomarch was usually also the head of the temple at the same time, or he began his life as the head of the temple and then transitioned into the mayor of the village, essentially. Um, 
And it's a really interesting idea because we have things uh, or, or scattered across second millennium BC temples later on that show the king or the pharaoh providing offerings to the gods, usually incense, bread, beer, linen, alabaster, uh, bulls, fowl, any of that kind of thing. Um, and they do seem to, all these offerings do seem to have been accumulated from other local temples that were sent down the Nile towards the king, and he kind of presents them in place of the other local temples. And the idea is that the king presents the offerings to the gods to maintain order in the cosmos. He maintains Maat as opposed to Isfet. It's kind of the, the core duty of the king. Uh, and in return, the king is rewarded with the regalia of kingship, essentially. Um, but it is... Not, that wasn't always the case, because we have a bit of an interesting, weird scenario going on, because actually in the early Old Kingdom, or even really the early and mid-Old Kingdom, it isn't until the late Old Kingdom that this stuff kicks off, in the early and middle Old Kingdom, temples actually seem to have played a very minor role. There was a, a, a funny sort of joke that was circulating about 10 years ago that the Egyptians didn't really care about temples until the Middle Kingdom. Uh, and even then, we have very few Middle Kingdom temples left. But there are Old Kingdom temples existing. They are just very, very rustic outside of the main um, the main sort of central areas, right? Um, they seem to have played a very minor role. The, the, the main focus of the religious worship was the king himself, or it was Ra in some, some areas that was syncretized with the king. So in the old kingdom, temples dedicated to the pharaoh and the spirit and sort of the deceased pharaoh are much bigger than uh, gods. So the pharaoh was a god himself and was therefore actually more important than the other gods during the old kingdom. It isn't until the middle of the new kingdom that temples to other gods actually start appearing. Um, although we have some local temples as well. Uh, although the only difference is maybe Ra, but Ra, again, he is a he is a god of kingship and Horus to a certain extent, uh, but he is still syncretized with the pharaoh that we see. Uh, one of the only, uh, well, we have two actually, uh, we have currently found two local provincial temples outside of major cities and they are on elephantine island which you see on the left here uh, and another there is another temple i think tell ibrahim awad i think um but in in these kind of areas the when we did the excavations the, it brought out these local shrines and they're dated sort of the fourth early third millennium so they are clearly old kingdom provincial temples for the most part and you can clearly see here right this is very very different to the kind of temple that you think of uh when you think of the egyptian temple right they are very very different from the monumental stone buildings that you know from the capitals for the most part they are essentially very small mud brick structures essentially uh, and they largely what's also really interesting is that when we look at them you can see a pan on the right hand side here when we look at them they largely lack any references to kingship or the pharaoh in any kind of way the architecture nor the wall decoration nor the abundant finds material reflect or reveal any kind of royal patronage on these in these temples they are very clearly separate from the state they are not influenced by the pharaoh or the administration the administration at all they are very clearly local temples uh and within the local community, clearly these shrines are the, f the focus of votive practice and local festivals. But again, they also serve the economic role because around, uh, you can kind of see it a little bit around here on, on this on this uh, this plan here, uh, but around the Temple of Elephantini, there were also, uh, we also found grain silos as well. So storage for grain, where it would have also probably then been distributed out to the members of the community from the temple or by the temple priests, uh, which tells us that the temples in the Old Kingdom also served an economic purpose too there. Um, but in other words, from... All the archaeological evidence that we currently have, including the inscriptional and the visual evidence that we have right now, the royal administration, the pharaoh's court, essentially, especially outside of the Memphite region, it does not seem to be connected to local temples prior to the late Old Kingdom. In the early and middle Old Kingdom, uh, the, the pharaohs kind of didn't really care too much about temples, at least the provincial temples. They weren't involved in them or there is no reference to them. Uh, but it, it, that isn't to say that the pharaohs didn't understand or recognize the relevance of them uh, but they just recognize the relevance of other temples different ones mainly ones that are connected to their own mortuary cult or to ra like i said in the old kingdom especially around the the capital areas like memphis uh, the temples dedicated to the king are much bigger and more 
fancy than the temples dedicated to the gods uh, and it's only in later periods from the middle and late uh, new kingdom onwards that god temples get better and bigger than the pharaoh temples uh, but as far as um local people this is all your local church your local shrine so to speak that the, the the central government had no say in or no influence in right uh, and following the models that have been pre presented by, I think it's uh, Jacques Gordon now, local temples seem to have been attracting sort of increasing in or increasing rural interest as time goes on, purely because they got involved in the administration, not because not because there was any kind of cultic uh, influence, although there probably was as well. Uh, it seems much more likely the pharaoh and the administration got more interested in these local temples because they were basically governing the administration of the domains and they sort of set up the royal mortuary cult so the temple would kind of collect all of the the offerings and the grain that you would give and then they would send somebody as an emissary down the nile with it all to to memphis uh, and then they would give it to the pharaoh essentially um so it's a really interesting time yeah you know, and this is this is one of my favorite uh, aspects of, of of this kind of archaeology i really love looking at um rural temples is kind of my thing a little bit um but for the most part you can think of a temple in in your local community as acting kind of like a magnet in the in the hinterland for the state in the third millennium you know unnoticed for the most part by central governments the local temples gradually start to emerge as the administrative node of the larger villages so the entire village centers around the temple for the most part and one of the ways that we we can see this when we know this is there is actually no word for religion in egyptian the egyptians didn't have a have this idea of, of religion right in, in the sense of when we say the modern word religion we essentially demarcate sacred and profane we say okay in the religion it, it's the cultivation of the gods that's how cicero defines religion uh cultus de autumn but the egyptians have no word for religion because they didn't, you know, they didn't, they didn't demarcate between sacred and profane. Their entire life was centered around religious expression. So there is really no distinction between the words for life and the words for religion in, in Egyptian, because it was just part of their daily experience, right? So it's a very interesting kind of uh, thing, I suppose. A very interesting thing. Yeah, I can't think. I can't think of the other word. Leave me alone. <laughs> All right. Well. So, moving into some archaeological evidence then, for, int oh, actually this is, uh, before I do that, let's look at this here, so this is a, a hypothetical reconstruction uh, of the Elephantine Temple on the left here, you can see it is a very kind of, mud it's, it's made of mud brick, uh, there probably was some kind of votive shrine uh, in the middle. Of, of the thing that people were emulating local gods or something like that uh and actually one of the funny things you find later on is when the when the pharaohs in the state do start taking influence in the local temples one of the first things they do is they get rid of the central statue and they replace it with a little niche out front that has a statue of themselves in it so then people are emulating and and, and sort of giving offerings to the deceased king rather than their local gods and that's sort of the the, the playbook for the late old kingdom that then all collapses during the first intermediate period after the no marks come in uh but this is kind of you know on the right we have one uh what we can assume is the sun temple of ra uh outside of giza um and with, with its valley temple its pyramid temple that kind of thing right uh with the, the the boat in the background buried there so you can clearly see these are these are two very different kinds of temples right i think we can all we can all kind of see that right even though they share some of the general architectural elements right the square the square layout and all that kind of thing but you can see this is a very rustic temple on the other side so drop a note in the comments or drop a note in the zoom chat right now which uh which one would you like to pray at a bit more i i, I don't get me wrong i love the architecture of the of the big old kingdom temples but there is something homely and nice about wattle and daub i have to admit um so i kind of wanted to see what would happen if i prayed at the rustic temples it's very interesting but there you go which one do you prefer <laughs> <laughs> all right now for introduce let's move forward yes okay so for introducing uh the cultural or the culture of the working population because we talked a lot about the royal administration there were the gnomes and that kind of thing right now i want to focus a little bit more on the working population now these guys are really interesting and to do that i want to look at some archaeological evidence because i want to look at a place in 
Upper Egypt especially, uh, that was excavated in the 1920s by an archaeologist called Guy Bronton. And it is essentially a series of cemeteries. It's two, it's two main cemeteries that have different layers uh, in the region around the villages of Kal and Badari. Uh, and these are essentially provincial cemeteries. They are cemeteries for the lay people. They are not royal cemeteries. They are very clearly uh, cemeteries for the peasants or the farmers around these two villages, right? And they were excavated in the 1920s, like I said. And at Carl and Badari, Bronton excavated a series of about 5,000 burials uh, from all periods uh, of, of Egyptian of Egyptian history, for the most part. Uh, but a large amount of them uh, date to the Old Kingdom. But it's, well, Karl and Badari have both been occupied continuously from the pre-dynastic period all the way through to Coptic Egypt and Christian Egypt. We have everything from pre-dynastic burial and pots in there to Coptic uh, invocations and thing and tablets invoking the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in, in the Christian theology buried there. So this has been a uh, a village cemetery essentially that has been occupied for all of Egyptian history, uh, and it is largely a provincial one, which is absolutely fascinating. Uh, but a, lo a large amount of the uh, burials, especially the ones we're focusing on today, date to the early Old Kingdom. Uh, that kind of period from around 3000 BC to about 2000 BC um, there. And you can see on, on this map here, uh, or, or the region here, and it's a smaller map uh, earlier that we saw there. And the tombs here, I want to say the tombs is in the early Old Kingdom are, are very, very simple. Right, that they the, we have basically three different types of tombs. Uh, on on the the most simple side, should we say we have basically surface burials, uh, and these are just sort of literally just a pit. Basically, they're like dug into a pit essentially. A uh, little bit more advanced, we also have uh, shaft tombs, some of which have a small chamber attached, so it's kind of a, a bit better of a dug pit that with like a sh uh, dug into a shaft essentially. Um, and we can see here in the middle, which are are very interesting. Uh, quite often they're not a very deep shaft, uh, they sometimes have a small chamber, like I said. Uh, and then the other one that we have usually uh, is is what we like to call chamber tombs, which are basically surface burial tombs that are lined with bricks, usually mud brick instead. So it's a bit more of an advanced form uh, of, of surface burial, essentially. Now, one thing I do want to say about this, before any of you sort of jump on this and go, oh my god, how many amulets and fun things were found in here? Amulets, there are a couple, I will admit, uh, but for the most part, all of the objects found in these graves are hugely, hugely simple. They are very rustic. They are very sort of low-end class peasantry uh, items, essentially. Uh, we have a lot of pottery for you, <laughs> for the most part. Um, you have some personal adornments uh, that you can see here, mainly in the form of amulets and beads for the most part. So be they seem to be very obsessed with beads. Uh, and you can see some of the amulets and things here on, on, on the right side, right, which is very interesting. Now, there are very, very few objects here that we can securely identify as, as what we would call high art. Right. And there is also very little writing in these burials um, around this period. There are some sort of etched little things on the amulets, but I wouldn't consider them writing. There's like maybe one or two things in there that have distinct hieroglyphs on. So again, this 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 area or this cemetery was not really a literate population in any kind of way, right? Uh, a very typical burial of this type looks a bit morbid, I know, uh, but a very typical burial of, of, of this type uh, are what we call pot burials, where a dead body, usually most often young children who died early in or in, in childhood, they are placed into sort of a vessel, or they're placed into two vessels, kind of like a, like a cooking pot, essentially, and then the, the pot is basically buried, on the, buried in, in the tomb, essentially, right? Uh, it, it, we don't think that the vessels here were built especially for the tomb. In fact, they most often seem to have been vessels that were already in use in daily life that just kind of went out of fashion when one of them broke, essentially. Um, and most likely, I find most of them actually uh, are brewing vessels. So they would have been used originally for brewing beer or brewing hops and, and barley or that kind of thing into beer. Um, there and then when when it's kind of gone, undergone that whole process, then it kind of becomes the the tomb or the carrier for the 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 family essentially. Think of it kind of like 
I don't know, in a, in, a, in a weird modernizing kind of way, if your mum likes to make stew, for example, and you kind of your mum has a huge cooking pot for stew and you kind of eat out of it all your entire life, you then get buried in the cooking pot, basically, and it goes with you. That's kind of the idea, but most of them we use for beer instead, right? So it's a, it's, it's a very nice kind of rustic uh, familial connection, I suppose. They're doing kind of the same thing of what the higher-ups were doing. They're just doing their own version of it in, in a manner of speaking, right? Uh, so it's quite a nice, I think it's actually quite a cute, uh, a cute thing. I think it's quite nice to see these kind of familial things and they are everyday people, right? They're everyday people doing what they can and giving what they can, which I think is very lovely. Um, now, of course, most of the burials described belong to what we call the classical old uh, old kingdom. So let's say around sort of 2500 BC, it's more or less stretching from like the fourth dynasty, fifth dynasty, maybe sixth dynasty up to about the 11th. Uh, that's, that's the entire span of the cemetery with the classical old kingdom it's around sort of 2500 bc that's where most of these burials come from um and this is obviously the period where most of the pyramids are built at the same time right so on the on the one side you have the pyramids and this is what you have on the other side in, in the provincial towns right um now of course m there are not many objects in these graves at all right because they are largely poor they are impoverished right their typical is ceramic pottery vessels like we've seen uh some come with stone vessels but there are also beads and amulets yeah, or forms of personal adornments in the firm form of rings and amulets and things like that um or mostly beads essentially right now there are also i want to point out that there are many uh, burials in this cemetery in Kaul Madari that do not have any burial goods at all so they just put the person in the ground, maybe did the burial rites, whatever it is, right? But there are one, there are cemeteries or there are tombs and, and shafts here, uh, burials, I should say, that have no burial goods whatsoever. Um, so when you think of the Tutan, when you think of Tutankhamun's tomb, for example, with all of its luscious kind of gold and ivory and chariots and the big sort of ship of Chaos or whatever that's been buried in the sand, the local people and the provincials are not necessarily doing that. They're giving what they can, but there are a large amount of them who don't have any uh, grave goods at all. So in fact, actually, some some Egyptologists actually have suggested that, from what we can tell. Burial goods in the provincial regions of the Old Kingdom are not seen as very important for, uh, as far as grave goods go. Grave goods are not seen as as important as they are for the main pharaoh, right? It, it really seems to be the the higher ups in the administration that want to take all their stuff with them when they die. The local people don't really care about that. They care. They seem to be caring much more about utility. So, is something useful and practical more so than? Let's just, you know, more so than the pharaoh saying, oh, let's put everything I own into my tomb so no one else can use it. They're kind of like the, the local people are going, well, is it useful? Let's put some pots in there. And it's like even the pots that the people are buried in, they're usually broken in some way. Right. So it's like usually when when uh, a pot breaks or something happens to it, then it's used as a burial pot. So they're very kind of pragmatic in their approach. It's very interesting to see. Uh, but as as we start to move out of this period, as we start to move out of, of sort of the early and middle uh, Old Kingdom, I mean, move towards the late Old Kingdom and into the following first intermediate period, uh, this is about the time period from 2300 to about, check, 2000, yeah, 2000, about like this or 300 year uh, time period. This picture changes dramatically. Um, because things get a lot more pronounced in the late Old Kingdom. Suddenly, it explodes and burials are, are filled with many, many objects as time moves on. Right? So clearly something is happening where that idea of the pharaoh putting everything in his grave is starting to spread by the late Old Kingdom. Because by the late Old Kingdom, these tombs uh, at... but. Um, Kyle especially, uh, they start to be filled with a lot more objects, right? Which is very, very interesting. Um, and again, they're kind of the same things though, right? It's, it's pottery, uh, the, most of them are pottery vessels of some kind, probably for kind of the eternal food supply, essentially. But there are a lot of personal adornments. Like you can see here uh, on this on this slide, they're mainly like little buttons or beads, um, like carnelian beads for the most part. Uh, and you can see on the right here a, a, a section or a collection of button seals here. They are very, these are basically very, very small, tiny seals with engraved patterns, usually geometric kind of spirals or floral patterns here that are usually cast on the underside of the thing. And we have like hundreds of these. They are, are ridiculous, right? Uh, and and next to next to the button seals, we find a, a huge other range uh, of, of of amulets and stuff too. Right, there are a couple of examples you can see here. Um, 
Uh, let me find go forward with my slide. Here we go. Yeah. So here are some examples, for, uh, not from this, not from uh, this cemetery, but from other ones in Nagara Lea. Um, way typical of these kinds of amulets are they are sort of amulets or, or necklaces or bracelets or anklets, whatever it is, or armlets uh, in the shape of hands and feet or legs and, and hands, which is very interesting. So they sort of made amulets of hands and made amulets of feet, essentially, which is really, really weird when you think about it. But they're actually, they are most often found on the body, uh, usually next to the area of the body that they correspond to. So uh, the hand ones are usually found next to the hands, or some people, I think some of them were even found holding the hand amulets. And the leg ones, or the feet ones, are found around, uh, are found around the legs, essentially. Um, here you, you can see, like now, they were mostly found, like I said, near to those uh, those areas. So, what's really interesting, actually, is that um, they were never found at their opposite things. So, the hand amulets were never found by the feet, and the feet amulets are never found by the hands. Right. So, there seems to be some corroboration there, which is really really interesting. Um, but now, of course, if we look at uh, this this next section here which I think is uh, really interesting. Right, so let me get all these up. Do, 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 do. There we go. So now, look at all of those kinds of things. Look at those pottery things. And let's compare these personal adornments found for, from the working graves of the population to these ones that are found in the Giza tombs up further up north around the, the ruling class areas, right? We can see that we have a totally different form of personal adornment going on here, right? These are found in the burials of the ruling class, and they are completely different. On the right side, you can see some examples of the personal adornments here found by people in the ruling class, mainly in Giza tombs. They are now currently in the Museum of Fine Arts, uh, which is really interesting. You know, we have broad colors, which implies spices and dyes and all that kind of thing to color in general. And we have sort of very fancy amulets, right? And we can we sort of match both of those together. We can see uh, the same kinds of things there. We can see that this woman lined them up. And this type of jewelry is the most common type of jewelry that is depicted in formal high art as well. So we have found archaeological evidence uh, of that as well. So just looking at these personal adornments and archaeological material, we can see two cultures, essentially, in El Kingdom Egypt, right? We have personal adornments, uh, as we like to say. Um, uh, I don't know, I said we come back to this earlier, didn't I? Uh, but just looking at the personal adornments and the archaeological material alone, right, we can see two different kinds of cultures in El Kingdom Egypt. We have personal adornments uh, known from the burials of the ruling class uh, and the ones that are depicted in art, and the other side of it, we have the wide or, or the other sort of the wide range of much simpler personal adornments, right? Found in burials of the working population for the most part. So there are really two different kinds of cultures that are existing in the old kingdom. And we see this division of culture also in architecture as well, like I said, right? Um, as I said, when we looked at those provincial temples, one of those ones in Elephantine, for example, uh, this was excavated and it's a mud brick structure. Right. Compare that mud brick structure. Uh, this is one of the most famous provincial temples. Compare that to on the, all of the plan to the royal temples as well here. You know, you can clearly, clearly see it's got an irregular form, informal structure. Compare it to the other temple and the reconstruction on the right here. Um, and the, the contrast is, is striking. Right. It, it, it's crazy for the most part. Uh, and in fact, inside uh, this this elephantine temple here on the right, we had a bunch of little cute clay figurines come out, which were really interesting. And again, compare these clay figurines uh, or similar clay figurines. These ones are from Hierapolis, uh, but these kind of things. Compare these votive offerings with this one in the center, which is of an official uh, from the Menfi region in Saqqara. Right. You can clearly see even on the provincial level, the art is very informal, right? The kind of culture, the kind of offerings that they're giving uh, is, is very, very informal. Right. And on this side, I just want to contrast the two. Right. We have the old kingdom temple provinces on the right hand side there. Um, and here you see an example of the formal art as well. There, which is really, really interesting. So already in this picture, we can see a very clearly divided old kingdom. We can see the old kingdom is a period of division in Egypt, where there are two very distinct cultures, right? We have the formal art and the formal kind of state religion of the royal residents on 
one side and we have the less formal art in the provinces uh, that is often connected with the working population uh, in these regions.